Um, I'm very happy to welcome Irene back to the stage uh, for a conversation and to uh, respond to questions from all of you. Um, so maybe I'll maybe I'll start, and maybe in keeping with the spirit of the project, I'll ask a few questions and then try to very quickly get as many voices into the into the discussion as possible. Um, but I know one place to start is we see in the in the closing credits um, the letters or maybe many many of the letters were anthologized in a particular archive between 1972 and 1980 um, uh, found their way into a particular archive and were maybe anthologized in a particular book. And I wanted to ask why sort of that time period um, and why that was a particularly meaningful sort of periodizing frame um, as a starting point for your project. Yeah, so that collection, 72 to 80, uh, I mean, first of all, just logistically, that was the first big donation of letters that Ms. made to an archive. Um, so 72 to 80 is the first kind of batch of letters that they archived, and there's a few other um, collections and other archives, and also at the Slavinger that cover other periods. Um, but also, I think for me, that really made a kind of perfect window for thinking about second wave feminism, kind of beginning. Uh, 1972 was the inaugural issue of Ms. And then uh, January 1981 was the Reagan inauguration. So kind of just thinking about that as a kind of really neat window for, um, yeah, thinking through kind of that history in a very specific way. Um, and yeah, I think now I kind of historically the 80s is this moment of great backsliding and, and kind of retrenchment of a lot of the work that was done in the 70s. Um, so yeah. About it. And then also, I guess then I should maybe back up. I don't know if I should, if it's fair, safe to make assumptions. Should we back up and, and just do a, a quick introduction to Ms. Magazine, the origins of Ms. Magazine, to make sure that everybody is on the same? How many people have heard of Ms. Magazine? <laughs> you think we're good? Okay, we're good. Okay. <laughs> My students okay. have not heard of All Ms. Right. Magazine, and that's interesting to me. I teach, I'm an educator, I teach filmmaking at UC Santa Cruz, and um, most of my students um, had not heard of, I mean, now they've heard of Ms. because a bunch of my students worked for me on the project. Um, but yeah, I think it's kind of much less visible than it was. Um, so I may be the last age of people, I'm in my 40s, so maybe I'm the last age of people for whom this was ever a visible and mainstream thing. Um, so it's true that it's, it's much less visible. It's still published four times a year, which people don't know. Um, it used to be monthly, and it used to be distributed in newsstands all over the US, and it used to be right, the kind of publication that you might encounter in a small town or kind of a remote area or a place where you might not have had other access to feminist organizing or media. Um, but yeah, that's not the case now. And I, I mean, um, a conversation that I have a lot in, in, in my particular house is sort of why or when the, <laughs> the talking head film, the interview-based film kind of fell out of fashion as a, if it fell out of fashion, when it fell out of fashion as a documentary form. Um, and you know, watching your, I mean, what, one immediate reason would be because like if you've ever tried it, like to do it right, it's so difficult. Like it's a, such a difficult space to operate in. And sort of what I feel like one of the really remarkable things for me about this project was just how fragile, I mean, it seems central to the film that it's a fragile connection and a tenu tenuous um, and a contingent sort of connection that you're making. And so I'm wondering if you just speak a bit about how you, how you, um, Sort of set some way like in, the, in the final text cards we get some parameters for how you are reaching how many people you reach out to um how you are and where you are casting or placing the letters but can you just speak a little bit about how you are sort of setting boundaries terms parameters for that space of the interview yeah very um and yeah i like that i'm very interested in the talking head film and i'm interested in kind of uh and demonizing the interview. I think there's been a pretty long moment in the art documentary world where the interview is out of fashion. And certainly I've been told for years that people talking is not very cinematic and that it's kind of cheating to just point a camera at someone's face while they're talking. And right, that's not kind of engaging with the world visually and um, right, it's telling, not showing, and that it's kind of a bad form. Um, and I think that comes from also like a long reaction against the kind of PBS format documentary. So um, yeah, so I'm interested, I think very interested and very deliberately trying to rethink what the interview and what speaking on camera might be and what listening to people speaking might feel like. Um, 
I watched a lot of 70s feminist documentary before I made this film, um, and especially, um, there's a big group of films that I think are not, are a little underscreened now, but that are kind of collectively made. Feminist films made in the 70s, um, films like A Woman's Film, Growing Up Female, Janie's Janie, Joyce of 34. Um, these are films, um, many of which came out of consciousness raising group methodology, um, and are films that are really, really, really talky. The, the premise of the films is simply women speaking to other women for a long time <laughs> on screen. Um, and I'm interested, I was interested in discovering those films to really feel like there's a kind of kind of actionable politics to the idea of uh, just talking and just listening, um, that that can be enough and that that can be a cinema. Um, so yeah, that's all stuff that I thought about a great deal when I went into the project. Um, but also, you know, I think it's important, um, like duration is important. Like I think there's a conventional way of treating interview where it's cut quite short and you're kind of looking for sound bites and you're even to the point where you're taught to like, look for the first frame of the important thing that the person says and like that's where it begins. And I think something different happens when you leave the kind of when you really allow a real time process to play out if someone thinking in real time, coming to language in real time, kind of negotiating what they might be about to say, uh, maybe even surprising themselves by what they do say by the end of the amount of time that they're speaking. Um, so yeah, so in terms of how the shooting was, so most of the people in the film I was meeting for the first time when we shot, I spent about an hour with each person. Um, so not like a huge, you know, it's not the kind of film where I'm building a relationship over a long time with somebody. Um, I didn't direct at all. I didn't tell people how to read or what to do. Um, most people also hadn't seen the text before they did the reading. Um, but I think what I found, and I, I went into the project kind of before I started shooting, imagining that the first take would be kind of the amazing take where something very interesting happens because it's the, because it has this real time quality, right, of someone really figuring out or responding to the text in real time. Um, but I think what I actually found is, is something about repeating the same text multiple times over several takes and really like embodying and actually really listening to the person 40 years ago that kind of through that process, something in, in the readings that um, felt really interesting or transformative, um, something would happen over, over that repetition. Like I think if I had walked around with a microphone asking people to talk about feminism, nothing would have happened. Um, so yeah, there was something about that method that felt like it was generating something. But yeah, I asked very, I didn't, almost didn't, it's maybe wrong to call them interviews, I guess, because I really didn't ask people almost Ch anything. Channelings or? Yeah, or embodiment. Like how did that make you feel is about the most intervention <laughs> that I ever did in, in any of these interactions. Um, yeah, and even letting, like letting there be space, which I think people are very afraid of, but you know, kind of moving through an awkward silence and then beyond that awkward silence to maybe someone is gonna say something else. Um. I don't know, I mean, one of the things that stood out to me is, I mean, there was a few of the readings where people, I mean, just nailed it, you know? And so, and I was wondering, so, you know, how, how close they were to how much time they spent with the text. Um, but I, I wonder, and you're saying that, you know, uh, people often read it several times, if you, that makes me think you're probably also including readings where are you putting the, the third or the fourth where someone actually by the third or the fourth was was much further away than they were uh, felt much more distant distance uh, between sort of themselves and the text how they were reading it than maybe they would have the first time no i think it's the opposite yeah that's what i thought at the beginning that kind of the interesting thing would happen the first time but no i think people got closer and closer more and more kind of deeply into the text through repeating it i think and are there people here who did readings they can tell me um, on that note, yeah. we'll take some, take some questions, comments. Yeah. Hi, thank you so much for this amazing movie and for the diligence it took to make it. Um, I need to be educated. Someone uh, said in the letter they, they had been goosed. I don't know what that means. And, uh, He's the, grabbing your butt. <laughs> I will get the spelling here. Um, and the other question is, you mentioned that the Miss Magazine is now only published four times a year. So listening to these 
uh, women voicing uh, the women from the 70s. One would say almost nothing has changed, but actually it has gotten worse. Can you explain why we don't have a Miss Magazine every month? Uh, that's a very good question. Well, we can wear pants to work now. That's the main thing that I discovered is that it's better. Um, but yes, most of we can have bank accounts. These are like the two frontiers of progress that have definitely been secured since the 70s. But yeah, everything else is either the same or worse, I think. That's not true. It's better for queer people, actually. That was, I think that is much better now than 40 years ago. But yeah, almost everything else is worse. You know, I don't know. Like when I started this project, it's been very interesting because I made this project. Uh, I started shooting in 2015 and I finished shooting in the fall of 2017. So I really made the project alongside the 2016 election. And as I was shooting, I think I definitely felt kind of more and more and more kind of energy and anger and emotion and momentum around the kinds of encounters that I was having with people. Um, when I started the project, I think it felt to me like public feminism was almost completely invisible and was not a topic that kind of took up a lot of public space. Um, and I think that's shifted even over the time that I've been making the project and maybe, you know, maybe there will soon <laughs> be another Ms. Magazine every month. Um, yeah, but you know, I don't know partly, um, there were, uh, as you saw in the film, right, there are a lot of people, there's a lot of also conflict, I think, um, within second wave feminism and, and within Ms. Readership and not everyone agreed about kind of what feminism should be and who it should be for and that's also part of the story, right? Um, and I think we see a lot of those same issues right now as well in, in the ways that we fail to speak to each other across difference in many different ways. Um. Um, it, the hat in the back. Hi there. Thanks, Irene. That movie was fantastic. Um, I was curious, you sort of began to talk about this in terms of going and thinking that the first take would be the most interesting. Did you go in knowing or, or with a sense that um, voice and embodiment and performance were going to be so important to the and and yeah to the film yeah i think so i think the main thing that evolved so the first summer of shooting i did in los angeles and i filmed about 60 people in three weeks so it was a really intense period of i think actually learning what like i had the idea of, of how i might make the film and i kind of tested it many, many, many times with a lot of people. Um, and I think the main thing that evolved was, I, I think I always thought voice would be important, but actually I think the way that casting became very central and like almost a critical casting of, of spending a huge amount of time thinking incredibly carefully about how to pair people up, strangers, how to pair strangers today up with strangers 40 years ago in ways that might generate or spark something, whether it's a resonance or empathy or conflict or disagreement or any number of things that I thought might be interesting. Um, I think that really evolved over those first three weeks. Um, so at the beginning, I was kind of much more just picking random people. Um, and then, yeah, like by, by the end of that period, I was actually spending a huge amount of time really thinking pretty carefully about who, who might read each letter. It was interesting that you used tuning forks in the soundtrack because I felt every single letter, every single reading of every single letter was a kind of striking uh, of, it's like a collision between the reader and the writer, and then a kind of interesting process by which you see the, the resonance that sort of occurs as a result of that person having read the letter, so it was very beautiful. Yeah, thank you for I love when people talk about sound, which they don't do often enough, but the tuning forks are uh, created by Miley Colbert, who's been my longtime sound collaborator. And yeah, we talked a lot about tuning forks and frequencies and things like that. Nice soundscapes, too. Yeah, she worked, she researched every bird. <laughs> um, it's a wonderful film, so thank you for making it. I wanted to just ask about, about halfway through, I was like in a trance just from the uh, the sounds of all the cars going by. 
and how I wondered if that was a choice to just kind of unite the places and how you decided to film everything outside. If that was just like, so you didn't have to pay for lights? <laughs> <laughs> no, so I wanted to film in public space for all of the readings and I, you know, I kind of thought a lot about what is a letter to the editor and what kind of voice or what form of speaking is that. It's a kind of public speaking, it's a form of public discourse. It's sort of kind of, you know, it's not like writing in a diary or writing a letter to your friend. It's a kind of writing that can be very personal and intimate, but that's actually addressing the public. Um, so I was interested kind of visually in putting everyone in some kind of a public visual space. Um, the actual location, so often people, like I would just talk, I mean, I was meeting strangers, so I'd be like where, I would explain the premise that I want to film in public space, and then I would invite them to pick the space they wanted. Um, so I wasn't necessarily choosing each and or curating every space. Um, but some great things happened, like the reading in Richland, Washington, which is in front of that like, 25 foot mushroom cloud that was like, yeah. donated by the class of 2012 of Richland High School, crazy. Um, but Trisha kind of knew, she led me there. She kind of production designed that shoot. So people kind of picked the places where they wanted to be standing when I was filming them. Um, but yeah, public space was important and public space in the US is very weird because we're not, you know, we're not very engaged with public space, I think, in most of the country. So often the public space is quite empty or maybe it looks the same from place to place or all the parks kind of look the same and have the same stuff in them. Um, so I was kind of interested both in what's the same and what's different as I moved from place to place. And yeah, there's a lot of cars. Things are very noisy. I think the one in Oregon is the only one without cars. Hi, thank you for a beautiful film. Um, I was curious if you could talk about the letters that were actually published in this magazine. Did they get the sense that the diversity of voices that were represented in your film was because these letters were unpublished, but I wasn't in there in the 70s to read the magazine and the letters. Um, so I'm just wondering like, about the diversity or lack thereof in the 70s of the letters. Yeah, so that's a really important question, and I think it's also a tricky question. Um, so I think uh, yes and no. Um, so yes, most of those letters were not published. Um, in some cases, similar letters were published. Um, but I think, you know, like I have a huge historical advantage over Ms. being kind of the person right now in 2018 who's curating. And I'm also making like an incredibly rigorous, stringent curation where I began with thousands of letters and I ended up with 27 that you've just seen on screen. So in many ways, I'm reproducing the problem of the magazine where I'm beginning with like, tons and tons of voices. And I was very aware, I think, as I was editing the film of the fact that every time I kind of didn't include someone in the film, that's like a, a voice that I'm right, not bringing up or, or not giving it space or not letting it talk. Um, and I'm also, I will, I'm making an interactive project actually after the film that will include a lot more of the letters that I'm not able to put in the film. Um, so yeah, like certainly I thought about which voices feel like they're incredibly important and matter right now in 2018. Um, and I definitely gravitated towards letters about race, letters from people of color, um, letters from trans people, which I was super surprised to find in the archive in the 70s. Um, so I'm, yeah, very much a contemporary curator of these letters and coming from a very kind of present day moment of thinking about feminism. Um, but I guess it feels unfair to me to, to um, yeah, the comparison, I guess, feels unfair. I think there were different different voices that spoke louder in the 70s or different issues that felt more pressing in the 70s. And I, I think it's hard to, yeah, I think just kind of um, also our relationship to the past, I think, feels different depending on exactly where we're standing in the present. So even over the course of making the project, I reread a, a lot of the letters several times. Like I read all of them first in the archive, and then I was, as I was planning individual trips, I would kind of go back and read region by region. And even over the course of the two years of making the project, sometimes suddenly a letter would feel incredibly relevant and important and resonant to me in a way that it maybe even hadn't a few months earlier. Um, so like the letter in Greensboro, North Carolina about the KKK rally, um, that was a letter I 
filmed about a week after the election, and I had read that letter before, and like actually not thought it was particularly interesting or important, and then like suddenly I'm planning this trip to the south, and it's a week after the election, and I reread that letter, and suddenly it really grabbed me as a really important letter that felt like it really spoke to the moment, um, but that was shifting continuously, even, even during those two years. Um, so I think, yeah, it's a tricky question. Can I ask a, a, a quick follow-up? Like, you know, having watched the film, we don't know what's on the cutting room cutting room floor. Um, watching it, we do get get the sense, as that question just sort of alluded to, that um, a recurring theme is the exclude. You know, is, is exclusion is the sort of policing of particular desires and the exclusion of particular subject positions from a sort of Ms. Magazine definition of, of, of feminism. And one, one of the things that I've noticed here, I think there's only once, um, there's only one time in West Virginia where you, I think you kind of, you respond uh, to the person and ask them, invite them to more deeply consider the context in which the original letter was written. But that's the one time that you sort of, you intervene. And I wonder if that was a process to get there to where you're basically, you know, you're, you're, you're giving space um, and not sort of policing. There doesn't seem to be, poli or, or guiding or, you know, their responses. Yeah, that's an interest. That letter is interesting. <laughs> and actually, you know, while it's true that I definitely felt like it was a high priority to include these kinds of voices that felt like they were more marginalized in the 70s, it also felt extremely important to me to include voices of more conservative Ms. Readers in the 70s and by more conservative women right now to voice those letters. Um, and that was very tricky for me to negotiate, like how I would do that, what would it feel like to have a pro-gun letter in the middle of this kind of feminist film project. Um, but you know, those are, there's a lot of people who are those voices in the US and I feel like, you know, promise of, of kind of at the heart of the film is this kind of ethics of listening and the idea of listening of class difference and, and even listening if you feel uncomfortable or someone's politics are quite different from yours. Um, and kind of thinking, right, that that, um, yeah, like that woman's feminism is around what position she has in, in the factory and union politics and um, the woman on the gun range kind of, maybe, I don't know if she would define herself as a feminist, but she's the only woman in her gun club and that kind of means something as well. Um, yeah, so I think those are kind of tricky letters, but they were super important to me, both to shoot and to include in the film. Um, but I, I do think they feel different from the other letters. Um, hi, I just wanted to ask about the process of getting in touch with some of the original letter um, writers, because one woman mentioned how she, you had gotten in touch with her and you'd sent her a letter and that she had remembered uh, that she had wrote something when you mentioned Linda Lovely. So I'm just thinking if you could talk a little bit more about when did you decide to look for some of the original writers and how you chose the specific ones to be in the film? You're sitting next to Claudia, who is the that. original yes. writer. She should be reading. <laughs> Claudia, do you want to talk about that? Or no, you don't have to. I'm putting you on the spot. <laughs> Ask the question again. How did she get in touch with? Um, in your case, how did she get in touch with? Like, is it? How, oh, sorry. I, I got it. How did she get in touch with? Me? Yeah. Okay. Well, I got an email from a woman from California, and it said you were very easy to find. And in 1976, you wrote two letters to Ms. Magazine that were not published, and I just came across them. And I was like, wow, I forgot all about that. And I, I was like, did I really write two letters? I thought I just wrote one. And I hadn't thought about it in 37 years or something. And so then Irene said, well, I wanna come to Binghamton, New York and interview you. And I said, okay, sure, not knowing what to expect at all. And then, there she was in my front yard, <laughs> and there was Bob. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, who was Bob? <laughs> 
Who's Bob? He used to run the gay volleyball. <laughs> and he was running for um, uh, Broome County Legislature, and he won. Yay. Is Sharky still there? And Sharky's is definitely still there. <laughs> But the original, when I started the film, my intention was not to look for everybody. So it was really just in a few instances where I became really curious, and they were each for different reasons. So Jenny Wren um, was the only, so I read about 2,000 letters, and Jenny's letter was the only letter from a woman who was kind of out as a sex worker in the, in the 70s. So I was super curious about who she was and why she was writing this letter. Um, and yeah, Claudia, I, it was, she was one of, I think, the only person who wrote two letters, and I, I remember the name, I have a good name memory, um, and this second letter had a very different, kind of much more confident beginning, so it was like, I'm a lesbian, and I'm in high school, and it felt very different, so then I, it just made me curious about what had happened in the six months between the first and second letter, and then when I looked up Claudia, who was easy to find, I learned that she runs a, a lesbian and gay resource center in Binghamton, so then I became super curious. Um, but yeah, it was really just a small number of people who kind of piqued my curiosity and were findable. Like a lot of people actually are, were not easy to find. They've changed their names or moved somewhere else or had very common names. Um, so I don't know that I would have been able to find tons and tons of people had I wanted to. Any last questions? Occasionally, the word click uh, appears. What does it mean? Yes, <laughs> good question. Uh, so click was a 70s thing. So in, I think, the first issue of Ms., there was an article. I'm going to get the name wrong. But it was, some, it was the premise of the article. It was an essay about being a housewife. And the article leads up to this uh, feeling where the woman suddenly realizes the entire structure of her oppression. And she has a click. So it's kind of like a light bulb moment. Um, and then this became like a rally and cry. So like hundreds of women are writing letters to Ms. describing their click moments and writing the word click in the letter. Um, so it was kind of a 70s thing. Right. <laughs> um, I, I'd like to say one last final question. Is that I'm interested in you saying that you're now working on an interactive project and I mean, maybe going back to one of my original questions, if, if you were to take the position that a talking head film isn't isn't a film or doesn't belong in a cinema. What one a position I wouldn't agree with uh, because it's not you know it's not cinematic enough. You know this is a film of, as you say about listening and what what's so useful about the space is like we're sitting there and and, and having to, to to engage and getting to engage with these people over 100 minutes. And so I'm curious what the impetus is for um, the shift and sort of what affordances you see in the interactive form um, that aren't that aren't here. Yeah, I mean I have mixed feelings about interactive work. Um, I think nobody listens. People are very poor viewers on the web, and it's kind of a space of non-listening. Um, and when I started this project, actually most people told me it should just be a web project because I was filming so many people, and it just seemed like an obvious form that you can just put 300 people on the web. Um, but I felt really committed to making a cinema film, and I know that that form is kind of, that's one of the few remaining forms where people will sit for a long time in front of something and listen quietly over time. Um, so all of that felt really, really crucial to me. Um, so I made the film anyway, even against <laughs> everyone's objections. But I do, you know, I do think what the, what the interactive project can do that the film can't do is kind of think about archives and think about that incredible richness and diversity of so many different kinds of voices and people and places that I found in the archive, and that's very hard. Kind of that's the limitation, I guess, of the linear film that you've just seen. Is like I said before, I was really, really aware of all the people that were cut out and all the voices that were not included and all the places that were not included and all the topics. Right, the, the film doesn't really get into disability very much, which there are some really amazing letters about. Um, yeah, there's just lots of other stuff that I wish I could have put in the film that people just wouldn't sit in the room for that long had I put everything I wanted to in the film. But I think there's something about, yeah, just this kind of big, messy, complicated, many, many, many person conversation that an archive can do and, and a film maybe can't do. So I'm, I think I thought of the project as both forms from the beginning. 
Um, well, thank you for making the film. Thank you.